Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Heroes of the Sanction campaign diary. This is session three, Into the Grey. Uh, so we played last week, uh, and it was a very successful session, actually. We got uh, a good amount done, and the characters have now moved themselves into a point of civilization, the first one that they've moved into, in fact, and uh, they have decided to go straight to the capital city of Haldrum, Grey's Keep. Uh, where they've done a little bit so far, and they plan to do more when we next play. Uh, I am recording this on a Friday, because uh, I didn't have time earlier on in the week, meaning that we are playing again tomorrow, so uh, uh, hopefully by the time this is edited, it'll be up by sort of like Tuesday, Wednesday next week, give or take. Um, getting a schedule to record these is very, very difficult, but it is what it is. But last time, uh, the characters, having escaped their captors, they ventured south, uh, meeting some characters along the road and moving north, uh, eventually reaching the Lazy Frog Inn where they had a run-in with bounty hunters who were after Muldal, and then an individual by the name of Calorel, who stole the corpses of these bounty hunters and made off, giving the innkeep a handful of red gold. The characters, wanting to know, know more about this Calorel individual, have taken some of this gold and want to bring it to Grey's Keep to speak to an arcanist or an arcane practitioner, perhaps Princess Miranda of Haldrum, who they've already met very briefly. Uh, for those of you who may not be in the know as to what's going on and who the characters are, in the description there is a small character key as to who all the players and who the characters are, or if you want uh, a bit more of a rundown, you can watch uh, the first or the second one, uh, which you uh, most likely would have watched anyway, but if you're skipping straight to this one, then that's fair. But as the, the, the characters uh, have since sort of rescued this inn, sort of, they have uh, camped outside, the innkeep did not want them staying within, uh, behind the frog statue, and the following day they got up and they left. Uh, the characters have, I think it was about a, no, it was, it was a three days trek to Grey's Keep, and the characters started out on the road, um, sort of hunting where they could for rations, because they were sort of running out here and there. I had a table of random encounters this time, I didn't pussy out because I didn't have the tokens I needed. Um, I've actually... Uh, I actually um, ran some random encounters, uh, but the, party, the the one that could have resulted in combat, the party actually manages managed to divert, which I'll, I'll sort of get to later on. Uh, as the characters moved further west towards Grey's Keep, I, I had a few sort of interesting things they ran into, including a ruined bridge, uh, the, the very small stone bridge that spread over a, a, you know, a whitish stream. And it was had several runes on it, and uh, because Mox can ritual cast detect magic, he used it, and he detected a lot of evocation runes and some conjuration runes. And uh, seeing the evocation, they elected to ignore the bridge, uh, which which was uh, amusing. And they whilst whilst resting, they encountered uh, a, a a man in sort of black um, in a black cloak on a black horse in dark armor, galloping past them, paying them no mind. Uh, th this is where some of the players started joking about Chekhov's gun uh, and how, you know, you introduce a gun, it'll fire later on. And um, and I, I think it was Derma. I want to say it was it was either Derma or Ethan. No, it was Ethan, I think, who, who said we've encountered like seven Chekhov's guns this entire campaign. And this is where I basically told Ethan flat out that it is a 50-50 chance as to whether one of my Chekhov's guns goes anywhere. Um, or is, you know fires at you know fires anything other than blanks, is because well the players may make choices that you know prevent me from using it, and or it might have just been a throwaway thing to to prove to the players that interesting things can happen in the world, and it doesn't necessarily have to tie in with their story, which which I think is an an, an interesting philosophy I guess. Um, uh, well I, I don't know about uh, like 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 an interesting. A thing that you could maybe deploy in your games and give a try to, so you become less predictable to your players over time. Uh, because I had that problem where, you know, everything I try to set up would be super predictable because I know how I set things up. So you, you give a lot of lot of false leads and and that kind of thing. I I feel like it, it's working reasonably well. It, I, it's like it could be improved. 
But the characters pressed onwards. Eventually, they came to like this ancient gatehouse. It's this old, dilapidated gatehouse from ancient times, perhaps. Um, and the characters are gonna move through, but uh, Gyro and, and Ollie, by extension, are sort of like, I kind of want to see what's inside this place, so I'm gonna go and like go inside. And I was like, okay, well, there's a there's a door. Um, oh, there's a door on the side. And he's like, yeah, no, I'll go in there. And him and him and Maldell go to go through, and they open the door to a big ass bugbear uh, and a hobgoblin um, who begins to threaten them. And uh, sort of the hobgoblin who appears to be leading sort of snaps his fingers, and a whole little group of goblins appear just above the portcullis that blocks this gatehouse and begin to aim short bows down at the pie. And he basically wants 40 gold from them. And at this stage, the party have a combined maybe 70 gold. Like all of the, all six of them together have like maybe 70 gold a push. Uh, so they're not big fans of that. So Dandelion, uh, ha having an excellent plan, offers sort of uh, her and Alfair kind of work together to trick the bugbears into thinking that the, some of the red gold they have, they have three pieces of red gold, they're going to give away one, is actually very valuable. Um, and Dandelion rolls a very, very high persuasion. Uh, she has good uh, charisma. I'm not sure if she's proficient in persuasion, but I know she has good charisma. Uh, but the the characters, you know, she succeeds. The Hobgoblin sort of says, fine, I'll take that piece of fancy gold and 15 gold on top of it. She rolled like a 19. Dandelion rolled really, really well. Um, and the way that she did it as well, she she did it in a way where she wasn't lying at all. She was basing it entirely off of Dandelion's thoughts. Uh, if I remember correctly, she says uh, these these scary coins we got from the Grim Reaper, the, referring to Calarel, which I thought was quite amusing and telling to Dandelion's character. She genuinely uh, believes to a certain extent that Calarel basically was the Grim Reaper. Um, the the Hobgoblin um, accepts their payment and allows them to go through. And you know th th this is. Um, I feel it was a little underwhelming, and I'll probably get into more as to why later on. But at the same time, I think there was a there was a layer of satisfaction for some of the players in the, you know, they bypassed an encounter peacefully. Though Ollie and Dermot were more itching for a fight, the the characters then carried on and they they rested up sort of amongst the once they got towards the farmlands, they actually started to see more people on the road. That only seemed like one couple. Uh, on the road at this stage, um, but there's farmlands that patrolled with guard, um, and, the, and you know the, the the characters actually have a night where they can sleep in the wilderness without fear of being accosted because of you know there's there's guard patrols they can rest peacefully and they don't need to have watches, uh, which 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 was nice it was it was good. Uh, but the characters woke up the following morning and traveled for the rest of the day through the farmland and eventually. So around late afternoon, reached Grey's Keep. It is uh, a city split in two by a river, uh, with an uh, with several islands in the middle of this large river. Um, well, the largest of them houses the 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 Grey Keep, the castle that is home to King Siric the Grey uh, and some of his family. Uh, there are also other major like structures within Grey's Keep, and this is where. Basically, I told the players because Althea is from Grey's Keep, and I basically said uh, the, the the rest of the players can ask any question they want about Grey's Keep, and if Althea knows the answer and she wants to tell you, I will tell you the answer because obviously Ethan knows nothing about Grey's Keep, but Althea lived there her entire life, so you know it's reasonable to say that I know what Althea knows, and I tell that to, to Ethan and by and everybody else by proxy and I, I basically elaborated that the city is split into several districts uh, some of them are quite nice some of them aren't there's plenty of shops there's a whole boulevard um, full of shops and there are three gangs in Gray's Keep there are the Dockyard Deadmen the Cutters and the Brook Street Butchers all three of these gangs hold specific districts of the city and varying sway over the politics and economics here. Uh, the Brook Street Butchers uh, own a slaughterhouse uh, and meat distribution business, and their leader, Bryson Roos, is a well, you know, is, is well known to, to be in the thick of things and 
has an alliance of sorts with the grand administrator of the city, who's basically like the mayor appointed by the king, who maintains the city whilst the king is dealing with national stuff. Uh, the Cutters are basically a gang of riverside, like, knife-wielding thugs, um, who are led by Hooklip Maud, who has a strong arm over a particular district of town, uh, which is frequented by High Elves, uh, High Elf refugees, Half Elves, and the sort. And finally, the Dockyard Deadmen are the workers of the Black Wharf, one of the two docks in the city, and they are sort of uh, bruisers, dock workers, all under the employ of one Ursula Del Frey, the owner of the Black Wharf. And that is, that is kind of the, the setup I gave for Grey's Keep, and the characters were really hooked on the thought of these three gangs, and they really liked the idea of them. And as the, as the characters headed, uh, sort of headed inside, the guards at the gate sort of stopped them and questioned them. They, they paid no real mind to, um, uh, Althea Modal and Aerin as they are uh, you know, a half-elf, a human, and a high-elf, respectively, and there is, you know, humans are the majority of the city, um, high-elves and half-elves are, like, uh, an enclave of sorts. Uh, but they do, you know, have a, a couple questions for Dandelion, that they're not pressing, you know, aggressive questions, they're just sort of like, huh, oh, what are you doing here, little mouse, we don't have any of your kind here, you know, what's, what's your deal? And they're a little more forceful with Gyro and very forceful with Mox. And Mox is like, "Hey, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a good, I'm, I'm okay." And uh, Gyro basically says, "You know, we keep an eye on him. He's fine." Uh, and I, I, I like that the sort of the the big dragon sort of taking care of the little one. It's 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 kind of sweet to be honest. Uh, but the, they they do they are let inside without any real trouble, and. Most of the characters then head to the Green Ring Inn, which is the main sort of port of stay for travelers in Grey's Keep, uh, which is in Teleria Square, which is very, very close to the entrance. Whilst Modal and Gyro, uh, or specifically Modal wants to go out and buy supplies, and Gyro doesn't want him going on his own, uh, especially since he is a wanted man, and uh, thanks to Aerin, who's managed to sort of make a disguise for him with her disguise kit, with a little bit of help from Althea, uh, Modal has kind of dyed his hair uh, a brown color temporarily and uh, is sort of using it to mask his identity a little bit. So sort of taking off some of his more extravagant attire. Uh, I think it's established that Modal has like an Ezio Auditore cape going on. Uh, but they, they go out and they, they just they buy some, I, I want to say like some rations. Oh, uh, Modal also buys uh, some daggers as well, some very nice daggers. Uh, the characters head into the inn. Uh, they see a group of, uh, like, you know, it's, it's like a regular city inn, there's a lot of regular folk, but there are also five dragonborn who come in not long after the characters do, and Gyro isn't here at the moment to react to it, but he will when they get back. But Ollie's reaction was, uh, was amusing. The characters in the tavern, so, uh, Aerin, Mox, uh, Althea, and Dandelion, uh, go up and they meet the barkeep, uh, Melinda Rain. Uh, she's a halfling woman, Dandelion has never seen a halfling, she thinks it's just like a child or a person with stunted growth, which is kind of funny. And the, uh, the characters, they basically buy rooms and they pay for some dinner. Meanwhile, uh, Modal and Gyro uh, decide, hey, we've heard of this other tavern, the Blood and Guts, which Althea said we should in no way ever go. Let's go there. Uh, so they did. Uh, they... Um, got, they paid sort of a couple copper for a rowboat at the White Wharf to take them across the bay to the Black Wharf, and, uh, they got off and head to, headed to the Blood and Guts Tavern. Uh, inside, uh, there is a fighting pit, and, uh, raucous noise, and lots of people getting very mad with each other. It is in there that they meet, uh, one Reina Ferrante, uh, who is a dwarven woman who Modal has a wanted poster of. She is, um... A, a rather stocky, uh, very muscular dwarven woman with a, a like an alabaster white mohawk and bright pink lipstick. And she is in the fight pit, kicking ass. Uh, and those guys in there, they get very drunk. Uh, Gyro gets in the pit and fights some, some other lady, and he wins, but only just. It was a, it was a very, very interesting fight. Uh, it was, you know, it was... Because they're, like, level 2, and I made this woman a thug from the uh, monster manual, they didn't have, and she'd already fought before, so she had less hit points, 
the it was literally just a fist fight and because you know they're at a level where like you can actually use like base you know punching damage and um it, it will still it won't take forever it only took like 15 minutes and it ended with gyro just barely getting a critical hit because uh, he does five damage from a punch because he has plus four strength and obviously punches do one damage and he crit while she was on six hit points so double the one is two he just barely knocked her unconscious whilst he was on like two hit points himself and one punch away from going down he barely won the fight it was very impressive everybody was super excited and it was easily the highlight of the night even though only two of the characters were actually present uh, it was not long after this that modal and gyro head back uh, gyro just sees the dragonborn and just tries to ignore them the, the gold does try to the gold one of them who appears to be the leader does try to interact with him which gyro is not very happy about but it was after this that they basically rested up dandelion had gotten very very drunk in the meantime and started crying as soon as gyro came in uh, bloodied and bruised uh, the general dandelion stuff one of the last things that happened during the night was Aerin. Uh, Aerin left the tavern for a little while, um, not long before Modal and Gyro got back, and she went up to the north half of the city, but instead went to the northwestern district uh, to seek basically where all the high elf refugees are. Uh, and there she encountered a woman, basically asked her a little bit about what life was like here, and this woman was pretty poor and destitute, uh, especially for a regal high elf. She was shoeless, had a, like a basically was wearing like a blanket as a, as a cover on top of like a, a simple vest even in this even in these autumn months it was it was not a pleasant experience for Erin as someone who is herself uh, to an extent a refugee of this of the same place Talonara fell and she gave the woman a, a few pieces of gold which um in you know in any setting will run a, a family who are, cons who are conservative on their money for a few days worth of food which is pretty decent and, and that was that was pretty much what she did. And I, I think it was a very telling piece of character. It was actually very, very interesting. And then Rosa sort of coming into her own a little bit with the RP, which is super great. The characters then sort of went to their, their rooms that they, they'd hired. So small little Skyrim tavern rooms. It's just a bed, a nightstand, and a wardrobe behind a door in a corridor. Uh, that's pretty much all it is. Uh, and that is where they rested. Tomorrow, the characters have plans to seek jobs from a notice board that Gyro and Moldal found outside of the Grand Administrator's office. Uh, Dandelion wants to go and find a particular professor of alchemy to uh, seek part of her backstory. And the characters are going to continue to look for an arcanist who can identify the red gold that they have at their disposal and that was pretty much the end of the session not all that much happened until they got to gray's keep and then things started to get really interesting so you know uh, that you know a lot of sessions tend to be you know, when, when you play dnd they get a little dull and then you have a moment where it's really really fun uh, th that's not unheard of and if you know you're a dm and you're having that you know it's nothing to bash yourself over as for sort of notes for myself for future the, the interaction between Dandelion and the, and the goblins was really, really strong. Um, and I, I think we're going to see more of that from Alice, which was super great. Sort of, I, I think one of the next things I, I like, with, with the goblins, I feel like the toll road should have been more interesting. They should have, like, lowered the portcullis. They should have been more dramatic. Uh, and I really kind of flopped that. But, you know, it is what it is. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, and um, the the characters still seem to have a, a good bit of fun anyway, so it's it's not the end of the world. Uh, the the next thing I want to know is not so much notes for myself, and more sort of uh, uh, advice to give. Uh, no, well, advice more more sort of ideas is that showing sort of destitution in the world is a good way to get your players to empathize with the people in it. Um, the world of Calabras is a world of broken homes. There are so many civilizations that have had their homes completely destroyed, or are in the process of having their homes destroyed, such as the elves, the dwarves of Kalazanbar, the, the Yuan-Ti to an extent. You know, all these civilizations being torn apart by other forces, and the, the, the destitution of these, these characters, I, I think, is sort of integral to maintaining Calabras as a setting. Uh, so having elves sort of reduced from, you know, their high and mighty status amongst the high elves of Talon Arafel to basically street urchins 
is very telling to the way the world is and how unpleasant it can be. And the same goes for the dwarves, except their sort of plight was a lot longer ago. Um, you know, there are dwarves who, there are adult dwarves who, you know, don't remember the fall of Kalazanbar, but there are, you know, most living dwarves remember it. And it, it's, it's that kind of sort of contrast, which I, I, I feel is making the world a lot more alive and a lot more interesting, which, uh, which I'm very happy about. Uh, finally, there's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a note about my DMing style is that uh, in my notes there is a section in the shops. So there is one shop that is detailed. And everything else is just create as needed. This is often the way that I DM in that I trust my ability to come up with stuff on the fly to lessen my prep time, um, because prep often is kind of a pain in the ass. Um, you know, it's not always fun, and what you just want to play the game. And I, I feel I'm at a stage in my DMing career where, generally speaking, not all the time, obviously, I can trust myself to come up with minor aspects of a place just off the top of my head. In the moment, I'm guaranteed to have, you know, I, I've proved to myself that in the moment I have better ideas than anything I write down prior. Uh, this has proved to be true time and time again, which is very, very helpful. So if, if, if you feel like you can trust yourself with sort of coming up with stuff on the fly, give it a go. You, you might enjoy it. But that is uh, everything for this campaign diary. I hope you've enjoyed watching this. Uh, I've enjoyed making it. These are very, very enjoyable to record. Um, the audio is not a pain in the ass to edit. And the actual thing, editing it together, is very quick, very easy because I'm not, you know, putting fancy graphics on the screen or anything. It's, you know, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's good fun. Um, so we will be playing, uh, since today is Friday the 22nd, uh, we will be playing again, uh, tomorrow on the 23rd, we're in, the, we're in a new venue, um, because Alice's place isn't free, and also because we're, well, we're just in a new venue, because we are, and, yeah, so that, that should be very interesting, characters will be doing lots of stuff in Grace Keep, I have some interesting things planned, I have all of it prepped, I have a few jobs the characters could do, uh, and I have some things prepped for Dandelion going to see this alchemist. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. I shall see you next week. Next.